Our guest today is David Kuhn, MLA for Fredericton South and leader of the Green Party. Thanks for taking the time, David. My pleasure, Dennis. Lots of issues on the agenda in the newly formed legislature. We're recording this in January of 2019, so you've had two, three months of some sort of settling of who's where doing what? Well, not so much settling. There's really only been, we've only sat four days in the legislature since um, Blaine Higgs won the confidence of the House. So uh, up until then, it was quite unsettled. And uh, of course, as a result, we didn't get much work done. The public service didn't get much work done as the government. And uh, there was a lot of writing speeches about other people's speeches. Uh, and replying to the throne speeches and so on and and so um so yeah when you think about it really we only had four days of regular work because uh, mm. you couldn't do really any regular work until um someone had gained the confidence of the house to lead a minority government mm. 2019 will be an interesting year for new brunswick politically um, walking into it for the first time with uh, four parties in the legislature which will invite a different process as well as invite um maybe a whole different conversation on some key issues. Do you have any early thoughts on that four-way conversation? It's, like I said, it's, it's early to, to, to say because we've only had four days of experience, yep. um, really, even though we were in the House much longer than that. Um, that was all about the, who was going to form the government. And, of course, in that atmosphere, it was very competitive, not cooperative, because, you know, we had... The Liberals vying to get the confidence of the House, the Conservatives wanting to get the confidence of the House, and so, so that created a very um, 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 sort of intense situation. Uh, once that was settled, so we only sat for four days. So in 2019, uh, this year, I'm quite interested to see how it shakes out. Um, we've, and, and it's complicated further by the fact that the Liberals um, uh, currently effectively don't have a leader. I mean, Brian Glantz is technically the leader, but mm. but really uh, he's stepping down and uh, they'll have an interim leader. Um, but uh, until an interim leader is appointed, there's, there's not much going on there. And uh, so that's, and then we're not sitting until March the 19th again. Uh, so that's actually quite frustrating that the Premier decided to keep the House closed down until then. There is committee work starting next week, uh, for sure, which is good. But um, but anyway, we won't be back in session until uh, March 19th. You spent your first four years alone in the legislature. This time you have some teammates, so to speak. Um, any sense what that's like, whether it's in the ledge or just the fact that you're not alone anymore in there and organization building? Um, yeah, it's very different, and it, it actually took a, little, took a little while to kind of uh, recognize that you know I, there were I could share share things out uh, with the others that I have seventy to do by myself in the past. So you know each of us have a number of different critic roles now. So uh, I, I did everything before. So now we've divided it up three ways, which is great, and uh, we've divided up committee responsibilities and. You know, we take turns uh, at question period. We don't have to worry about getting motions. Uh, I don't have to worry about getting motions seconded anymore. Uh, so it's been very good. And, and just the, 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 the sense of being able to uh, toss ideas around among uh, a small caucus of MLAs is uh, great. Um, so that's it's a very uh, different uh, kind of uh, uh, landscape for me. Yeah, it must feel good. I assume it feels good. It does, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On the political party building side, um, this has made, been also a shift for the organization as well. Have you sensed uh, uh, growing membership or uh, uh, kind of like more firm footing? Okay, we're here now, like we're established yeah. now. Yeah, well, when you look at the evolution of the Greens in New Brunswick, uh, you know, back in uh, prior to the 20 2014 election, it was, well, you know, the Greens aren't going to be able to actually elect anybody and so I got elected but then and then it, then it was well you know there was a far away race and he came up through the middle and likely you know he's not going to get elected a second time and the sense that because I was the only MLA that it was a Fredericton based party and so on um, so with this election in 2018 uh, uh, convincingly re-elected uh, in Fredericton with MLAs in uh, two very different ridings, Kent North, uh, young Acadian, uh, and dad, a new dad in uh, Kevin Arsenault, 
and uh, and then Megan Mitten and uh, Memorco Tantramar are also a young mom. Uh, so it's a great combination. Um, so it, it dispelled the notion that it's a fraternity based party, that it's a, an English party, not not a you know fully New Brunswick party, uh, with uh, even the small caucus we've got, because we're one third Acadian francophone, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one third uh, women, and uh, two thirds youth or not youth but young, yeah. um, with uh, both my colleagues being in their thirties. Um, it's uh, it's nice to get that mix as well and have that perspective. Uh, all those perspectives brought to the, d the table for discussion. For the longest time, mainstream media uh, portraying Greed Party as the, the environmental activist bunch. Mm -hmm. um, some of it's a leftover of your legacy, um, previous work, but also nationally that was part of the national narrative as well. Um, the way you just described things, uh, is it past now? Is it finally gone away that you're a full-fledged <coughs> Full meal deal, political party with uh, perspectives and strategies for each of the different issues that New Brunswick faces. I think we're getting there. We're almost there. Yeah, um, certainly uh, this passed for for the Greens and PEI some time back. Um, I think for two reasons. There, uh, one, their leader was a dentist, um, so um, you know he was a dentist and became leader of the Green Party. So it's a bit different than someone who'd spent their career. In environmental advocacy and organizing, um, to uh, <laughs> in education to become the leader, and the other thing is the size and the cohesiveness of uh, Prince Edward Island was such that uh, you know it's, it's easier to get your message out and become well known across the entire province compared to uh, the, the, the more regional nature of New Brunswick. Um, so, so but it's 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 getting there. Yeah, good, good. Um, because that will only help the four-way conversation be more fleshed out rather than um, getting past the Green Party being dismissed as, well, this is their main concern, they don't pay attention to these other things. Yeah, and I think what, what, what the legacy of that, though, will be that's important is, well, the Green Party is the only party that actually takes the environment profoundly <laughs> seriously yeah. um, and has good ideas about how to, to address environmental uh, uh, concerns. Um, so that's where we need to get to on the environment, yeah. uh, rather than uh, that stereotype of that's all they care about. Yeah. Speaking of that, environment, much like food, will be one of those issues that will wheedle its way through every one of the major issues about to come up. So as uh, Premier Higgs now somewhat established and will start to try to roll out an agenda, and with uh, Green Party working as... Um, issue by issue, and Mr. Austin and his People's Alliance have said something similar, um, it'll force an interesting conversation as you introduce environment into pipelines or environment into fracking. Do you want to play in that space a bit? Because it's going to get intense soon enough about fracking or pipelines and agendas and what's good for the economy and trying to lace into that what's good for the environment is good for the economy. So I guess a couple of things there. One, first of all, I think Premier is operating um, in a way a bit differently than maybe he imagined because he seems to be feeling very comfortable with the support of the People's Alliance members. Um, so the first time that they vote differently, or enough of them vote differently, that, um, that he loses a, a vote on a bill or, or whatever, then uh, I think that will help change the dynamic a little bit. Because um, I saw a shift at the very beginning after the election. He very much was uh, focused on, you know, the minority government as a gift from New Brunswickers and for New Brunswick to do things differently. That's what people want us to do. Uh, but, uh, but right now, with, the, with the, uh, uh, what seems to be pretty entrenched support from the People's Alliance members, he seems to be feeling very comfortable and not so motivated anymore to to uh, work uh, collaboratively across the uh, Legislative Assembly. Um, so that's an interesting uh, dynamic that's going on there. Um, with respect to the issues of, well, so, so uh, on, the, on the flip side of this, um, the cabinet ministers are all very much open to those kinds of discussions. So I've been going through and we've been going through a process of meeting with uh, different cabinet ministers on issues that are important. And, uh, and so there, there seems to be a, a real 
uh, openness to discussion about um, you know priorities and and uh, what would we like to see happen and and, and if that's been very positive um, so meeting with the Minister of uh, Social Development, uh, for example, uh, before Christmas, the Minister responsible for Energy and Resource Development, um, and uh, coming up, Minister of Economic Development. Uh, so, you know, th th that at this point, th that's where those kinds of discussions are occurring, um, and it's been very positive to kind of just to understand each other, exchange ideas, um, which is great. How that translates into <coughs> what we see in the legislative assembly, we'll we'll have to wait and see. Um, yeah. So take take an example on on uh, on uh, making the energy transition to uh, get away from our heavy dependence on fossil fuels to a much lighter dependence. Um, the province, the premier, recently said he was going to endorse the. Uh, former government's climate action plan, their, their sort of, uh, what do they call it, transition to a low-carbon low economy strategy. Um, but we don't see any urgency so far um, to implementing that and seizing the opportunities that are embedded in there to, to uh, you know, pursue economic development that's, that's ecologically sustainable that will also <coughs> shrink our carbon footprint and reduce the uh, uh, living costs for people in terms of lowering their energy bills. So um, w we'll see. I just wrote the Premier actually on that, suggesting oh, here are five key uh, priorities in that plan that, uh, that I believe we should be uh, implementing with some sense of urgency, and they're all going to have strong benefits on a, in, in multiple areas, economic, environmental, social. Let's get at it. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to the Premier's reply. Does that strategy in your five points um, impact the way the current media are portraying uh, the Premier fighting against the carbon tax? You know, I'm fed up with the whole carbon tax debate. Um, I, you know, so it's, it's it sucked all the oxygen out of the room on talking about climate action. You know, what do we really need, need to um, be seriously begin the transition away from a heavy dependence on fossil fuels to renewable energy, uh, away from uh, energy waste to energy efficiency, um, <laughs> and and how do we better protect ourselves against uh, the consequences of climate change that we've been now feeling for some years and are only going to get more intense. Uh, so that's very frustrating. Uh, you know, the whole notion of climate action and what we need to do in response has been boiled down in the media, anyways, to to carbon prices or carbon taxes. And uh, you know, I've never been particularly fussy in terms of seeing this as a be all and end all of anything. Uh, it seemed to me that it was a, the ma the main impact or, or potential around a, a price on carbon was how you use the revenue. If you invest the revenue in actually um, using that to help people reduce their use of energy and, and, and switch over to more renewable sources of energy, heat, power, and fuel, that um, that's going to uh, have an impact. But the price itself, not so much. You know, you look at if it's, if it's just the price you think is going to make an impact, you're, you're wrong. Uh, there was a paper recently that looked across 30 jurisdictions worldwide who have had carbon taxes for a long time. And uh, the average impact overall on emissions is about 4% reduction, 4%. So, um, you know, it's not huge. Uh, so so we're, we're, we're all this political capital and, and, and political debate is going on around this. Um, and meanwhile, you know, the, the, there's no sense of urgency to take real action to get our emissions down. So uh, I'd be just as happy if that whole debate would disappear. But um, the way the feds are going to roll it out uh, in uh, places that don't have their own system, like in New Brunswick, it'll uh, take effect uh, for consumers April the 1st, and, uh, and then we'll be getting checks written in an amount more or less equivalent to what we pay annually. Um, so uh, maybe once it's in place, we can get on with actually tackling uh, climate change and, and uh, how to build a society in New Brunswick that... Uh, that uh, makes sense in the 21st century. 
Your comments remind me a touch of the interview with Carl Duvenvorden and Peter Corbin. Right. We did a show on uh, climate change and how it will impact New Brunswick specifically. Right. Both Carl and Peter saw huge opportunities for adaptive technologies and adaptive approaches and then you could out, not outsource it but sell it. You know, it's, yeah. and So do you have any sense, because you'd be one cog in that wheel, or politics and political change would be one cog in that wheel that encourages uh, what Carl called the, the backyard genius, or the genius that works in the back of the shop that knows how to fix everything. Yeah. And, and he sees an untapped potential and all that talent in there, but that would be one piece of what you just described. Yeah. That would be the person on the ground that knows how to do it. Yeah. And then you're, you know, can we get on with talking about the adaptive technologies we need and implementing them? Yeah, well, you go look around New Brunswick, you look at the builders who, who are building uh, uh, extremely energy efficient homes that are significantly heated with passive solar heat and and uh, companies like uh, uh, Renew uh, Next Gen Renewable Energy that's built it for a solar farm in the province and is, is so dedicated to driving a, a supply chain for solar power that is, you know, rooted in New Brunswick mm -hmm. um, to... Uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Jacques uh, and and Rock, um, just lost the last name for a minute, but up in the Grand Falls area, who who uh, who developed and are operating a, a biogas uh, electrical power generator based on uh, their manure from their dairy farm and, and food waste from McCain's. So they're selling electricity to MB Power, um, Laforge, uh, their last name. Uh, yes, all over the province you see this, uh, whether it's uh, uh, archi architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, farmers, woodlot owners, people who, who are great at uh, 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 inventing things and developing things and, and, and conceiving of new ways of doing things. Um, that's what uh, we need to be fostering more of. and. Uh, that's you know that's an opportunity that I feel that, that we, we, we keep we keep wasting maybe in support of that there was a news story yesterday or today uh, China no longer will subsidize the solar power production that they're doing because they've built enough of an infrastructure and a demand that it now pays for itself yeah well ex exactly and, and, uh, and there's lots of examples of that sort of thing I was just reading the other day in Waterloo in Ontario, uh, a company has just opened up a commercial building that's the first net zero energy commercial building in the country. Um, one of their partners was Stantec Engineering that uh, operates here as well. And uh, to your point, that pe tenants are, are flocking to rent space in there because they want to be seen by their clients and customers to be working out of such a place. And so uh, the intent is, to, you know, for the company who designed this to to see that happen elsewhere. It's exactly that kind of thing we, we should be doing here. And, uh, and uh, we just need, we need to, I mean, government from an economic development perspective needs to see that opportunity. But I'm afraid uh, so far this government, like past governments, have been stuck in the, in the old sort of paradigm of, you know, large scale projects equals economic development and that's what the pretty well their overall focus is on. So in, in the case of, well, both Mr. Higgs and Mr. Gallant, the pipeline um, they had in common is an example of, of that. And the, and the, uh, not just the pipeline, but the, you know, the export terminal, which would ship the bitumen and so on overseas. But, but so, so the kinds of economic development opportunities that really drive local economies from cities to towns to villages to rural communities hmm. um, it, it's it's uh, it's like eating lot it's like sort of um, uh, well it's not a good good metaphor but but anyway I don't know why I was thinking about eating lobster but anyway uh, <laughs> <laughs> that goes with energy efficiency is eating lobster is like if you're trying to save energy you've got the big uh, claws and you get the meat out but they need to pick the little bits oh, of meat the little out work, yeah. yeah that's it anyway uh, sorry about that aside no. so yeah it's uh, it's and I think uh, I'm looking forward to the meeting with um, Mary Wilson who's our new minister of economic development and small business because her background is uh, advocating for small business and uh, you know so so I think my sense is she's kind of 
built that way and uh, and I'm looking forward to discussions around well what are the real opportunities for New Brunswick's uh, small and medium-sized businesses several past interviews sometimes with economists sometimes with business people um, the way you speak also likens itself towards the issue of scale so what is the best solution for New Brunswick's economy to finally take a step forward because we've been approaching it the same way the past 30 or 40 years it tends to be the industrial or large-scale model yeah. Um, more and more, it looks like what should emerge for New Brunswick's particular case is a local, regional scale that can satisfy itself to a certain degree within a certain limited market because of our population size, but also create export potential because of knowledge on technology innovation or creating a certain product that would then go down to the eastern seaboard. Yeah. But that's going to be a culture shift. Not unlike um, healthcare needs a culture shift in that I have healthcare services if I have a hospital in my community. But the interview with John McGarry when he was CEO of Horizon Health talked about regional healthcare delivery mm -hmm. and centralization and new hospitals to have new equipment so then you can recruit doctors. And yes, you might have to drive the hour and a half to get what you need. But the old culture from the 60s, I have a good community when I have a hospital in my community. I th can you play in that tension between maybe economics for New Brunswick breaks down to like the 100 mile diet mindset, yeah. but also for innovation, but also for permaculture, and then we can get over a hump economically that we so far haven't been able to with the old model. Certainly, and, and this is consistent with, with the sort of the, the movement uh, that, that existed in the Maritimes prior to sort of globalization uh, taking off um, which was exactly that you know with all of the the angst that we went through years ago around underdevelopment in the Maritimes and uh, lots of great people thinking about how do we how do we develop differently here that's gonna make a fundamental difference um, and it's exactly that notion of becoming more locally and regionally self-reliant um, uh, that generally seemed to emerge as the consensus uh, which got lost as uh, globalization took off, and uh, we're coming back around to it now, which is which is which is great, and uh, and certainly there's there's good evidence uh, both in our own history um, about the impacts of of a more uh, self-reliant local and regional economy and society, um, uh, and and certainly from other places as well. More recently. Um, but it d does take some examples, I think, right? So on the healthcare side, for example, you, if people, as people become more aware, for example, of the, what, how the downtown community health center functions, uh, it's quite revolutionary in the sense that they are approaching people's uh, their patients uh, in terms of their physical health, yes, but also their social health. It's integrated. Social health and and, and physical health. So, you know, one of the physicians uh, at the downtown community health center, you know, uh, asked me if I could help facilitate a meeting with the minister of social development. You know, talk about issues on the social development side because of the social determinants of health. Uh, so that's very exciting. So that does represent a, a cultural change in in healthcare. And I know that uh, uh, Ms. McGrath, the uh, head of um, Horizon is very keen on trying to roll that approach out to, to primary health care around the province to increase the number of uh, community health uh, centers with this integrated, more holistic uh, approach um, based on a team um, delivering primary health care in communities. So that's quite exciting. On the on the economic side, I think you know if we if we could have a a, a clear and visible win on that. Um, with with something. So if we said, all right, we are going to um, uh, the first step we're going to make is on on local food, and uh, and put in place the, the policies and measures to do that, and use government procurement to kind of um, jumpstart the the market, um, so that uh, uh, we set it, set some targets using hospitals, um, nursing homes provincial jails and schools uh, as the market for local food to drive that and uh, and then we'd be able to demonstrate in a four-year period pretty much 
mm-hmm. uh, some really positive consequences of that. Um, and you can see it on a, in a microcosm in, a, in, in, in some local places, like in the Miramichi, um, where, where uh, Carrefour uh, Beausoleil, uh, the Francophone Community Center and School, which is a, a really nice mix there. So it's a community center wrapped around a school run by a nonprofit mm-hmm. um, that picks up all these nice kind of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, not overlaps, but uh, where the supportive, it's the kind of mutually supportive activities. Mm-hmm. So there, for example, they're providing local food to the uh, children uh, in, the, in the cafeteria uh, at no more cost than uh, imported and more industrial produced food. Yeah. Um, how are they doing that? Because they are also um, selling food in the community that they're producing in their kitchen, like lasagna yeah. uh, that's made from uh, almost all New Brunswick uh, food. Um, and so the revenue they're gaining from those sales in the community and see the kitchen for the schools being run by the nonprofit community center. Yep. It's a fantastic model, yep. which um, in the education system, would I, I want to see you know repeated, and others do. Sackville's pursuing something like that or trying to. Um, I've met with some parents uh, in Fredericton uh, over the uh, Liverpool school that at some point is going to be rebuilt or new new built yep. um, to consolidate Forest Hill and Liverpool. And uh, the idea of first, let's let's get this nonprofit up and running because it's going to take some time to get to, to on the priority list where the new school is going to get built. Uh, so that that's all ready to go, and so you can you can demonstrate from some living examples uh, how beneficial it is to the students, how beneficial it is to the community, um, and and overall creates this momentum um, as as we're seeing in the Mary Machine in the food example. Based on what? Based on a uh, initially a goal to supply local food to the kids in that school, and it got much bigger when they said, "Well, how are we going to afford to do this?" And they came up with this system. Yeah. Sounds very similar to CDC at Centre Communautaire Saint Anne in Fredericton, where it's run by a not-for-profit group. They've yeah. got a whole manual now on how to roll it out. It employs 30 people who buy us local food. Yeah. and puts it into the school system and then it complements itself with some catering and some yeah. other places. Not not surprising because Marc Alain, who was there, set that up, <laughs> is that care for Beausoleil now. Uh, the difference, though, is that uh, in their machine, it's a non-profit community organization that runs the sort of community part wrapped around the school, mm-hmm. um, which is a little more manageable in, in trying to for, for for parents and community members to get their arms around because here at uh santa community saint and it's a crown corporation yeah. and so it was like oh how do we <laughs> replicate that yes that's it's like well, no but it's not going to happen but you know a, com- a community group that creates a non-profit yeah. to be wrapped around a school and you fantastic but but this also indicates where change happens it tends to be at a smaller scale and a local level and have a lot of interconnectedness of parts that are kind of waiting for the right precipitating moment or the right thing to come along that gets them together. So the essential thing for politicians on this, because they always go for the you know the big things they can cut ribbons on and all this stuff, is to make uh, these kinds of uh, initiatives that represent real change as visible uh, and digestible as possible for uh, for people across the province yeah. to get a sense that you know when I, I like I'm in a very um, you know uh, unique situation that I because of my job I get to go visit places like this and spend time and talk to those who are involved and so on and and get all excited by them and so many people never heard of them so w- w- there needs to be effort put into just um, making these visible to New Brunswickers, so people see the real potential based on what our own people are doing in our own province on their own initiative, yeah. uh, in a way in, in, in community. So it's very exciting, <laughs> yep. right? But if you don't see that and aren't aware of it, it's so easy to fall into that trap that you know, well, and, and nothing's going to change. And it also gets into again at the political level is like, how do you get that excitement you just expressed? through a political system, um, through a legislature, so that it does become policy, compared to, well, this is the way we've always done it, and this is the model we think we're going to try. We might almost be at a point where 
there might be more willingness to let go of the way it's always been done. Because 40 years later, it's pretty clear the numbers keep telling us it's still not getting any better. Maybe. And it's got to be self-driven. So the next piece to shift has to be the, the political mindset, which is going to get in, and it's going to be tough, but it's going to be tough. Well, it's letting go of control, yeah. not being in power, but being in governance. Yeah. Uh, all those little shifts. It's a, it's the political mindset, but it's also very importantly the mindset of the little, at, the, at the level of the civil service, of the public service. Both of those things um, have to shift, and uh, and that's that's critical um, to to start to look at because it means giving up control. It becomes a bit um, uh, unnerving uh, for for folks, right? Because I mean, in government, because they they can't control what's going on and, and if you're if you move into a, a sort of paradigm where you're uh, there to help empower and, and support um, right rather than designing and implementing um, it's very different maybe to support and then please carry on interview with Blaine Higgs a year ago before the election I was talking about the need for systemic change in the civil service mm -hmm. and I kind of forgot myself a bit and I wasn't just listening I, I got into it a bit saying Oh, systemic change, that means you're going to need a pause, and it means you can't control the outcomes. Right. And and Blaine went, no, no, we got yeah, to yeah. control outcomes. <laughs> and his hand starts doing this. Yeah. And I, I, did, I chuckled and went, oh, I forgot I was talking to you. Yeah. you know? Well, that's the thing. You can't so, control the outcomes. Yes, um, but, but you can have guiding principles, you or you can, can have yeah. targets. But it's very yeah. different from the civil service point of view, but they're measured or they're accountable based on those outcomes. Right. But... Of course, but but to better to better meet local needs, the outcomes are going to be different in different local areas. That's the key thing. Yep. So yes, you have principles, you have all of that, um, but uh, but this is what's so exciting. But it it it, it it's a huge leap. Uh, I remember when uh, uh, reading the book that um, Doug House, a sociologist, wrote uh, in Newfoundland when he was asked by the. Newfoundland and Labrador government are trying to implement some of the recommendations out of the big Royal Commission they had some years ago on, on employment and unemployment, which was very much about about empowering local and communities and regions, uh, you know, the 18 regions or whatever they have in Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm -hmm. And and his frustration about trying to uh, move that agenda forward uh, was really based in uh, initially, the barriers that he was running into within the public service itself at senior levels, because you know this represented quite a sea change, um, and uh, and you know you lose you, you lose control of the outcomes. Um, so 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 he wrote a book to, to kind of describe that whole experience, and then that got complicated too when governments changed and you, and they got. Uh, um, uh, Brian Tobin and then uh, Danny Williams in, who were not of the same mind that uh, the Clyde Wells, for example, had. Mm -hmm. So that makes a difference. So it's it's both working together, right? You have a, a leader with some vision, uh, and I, I just don't mean to put it just at the premier's door, but the yeah. leader and their 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 uh, elected colleagues with some vision, um, and then uh, that helps should help drive the public service, uh, but it's not as easy as you would think. I guess that was his message and why he wrote the book. And, and I went to meet him in Newfoundland. Uh, fascinating guy, uh, Doug House. Anyway. Similar conversation with Dave Alston sitting in that chair two summers ago. Um, at the time, he was supposed to be the uh, entrepreneur guru within the, in the government. His chat, the thing that stuck with me the most was um, he recognized the government had no mechanism for change. And he was coming from his particular world in IT, which was all built on a fluidity and a, and yeah. a certain kind of elasticity yeah. for the thing still holds together. So that kind of took him aback from, to put words in his mouth a bit, but the way he was talking, is, so he, I never thought of that before, that the government doesn't have a mechanism for change. The government's role is almost built on status quo. Mm. So we're at this interesting moment in time in 2019 and moving forward the next two or three years. So how do we get the, that model to be able to be adaptable and playful and creative, well, and, and still maintain its cohesion, still hit its whatever its goals are. But well, we have to change the dominant narrative that is out there in the media and among too many politicians and others who have kind of taken it up, which is you know we're we're going over the cliff and we're <laughs> up against the wall and we have no money and all this stuff. That's very negative. That's very scary. Uh, that 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 is not helpful mm -hmm. at all. Um, so, but if you don't have a vision for where we need to go, yeah. 
as we've been talking about sort of our local regional self-reliant kind of approach then uh, which is f far more community driven then um, then maybe you, that's why you think that way mm -hmm. um, but we've got to lose that narrative or we're, it's going to be so difficult to move uh, move the population we're talking about kind of a societal shift here I think New Brunswick is already for it I remember when and maybe I've said this before uh, another time when I went uh, with you but you know when Sean Graham originally brought out his strategy for self-sufficiency it was called uh, it was received so well people were very excited uh, by the idea of becoming more self-sufficient but it turned out that's not what he was talking about he was talking about you know kind of austerity measures to 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 uh, reduce our dependence on yep. on transfer payments which has kind of come back as a discussion but but uh, and then people are no that's not what we're interested in you know we were talking about food and we're talking about yeah. you know tr being masters in our own house and becoming more self-reliant and all of this and uh, because it resonates with our character yes uh, and and our our culture and our sort of values in so many ways uh that uh, it gets people exciting because that's a, where we've all come from you know we've had to be very self-sufficient in yeah. history and we can, in any of our families, you can look back and say, look at how they survived, yep. right? And we haven't lost that notion. It's just lost from the way we do things now uh, as a province. Yep. And one way to insert it into the narrative, and another piece that kind of builds the fear narrative, like you just described about um, before, is, is the debt and deficit conversation, yep. the way that is all framed up all the time. Yep. Uh, off on the side this time, but it never really took hold, but it hovers, is that whole notion of Bank of New Brunswick. Yeah. And uh, past guests have been on the show, and they've mapped out the details and the rough parameters. It's probably worth exploring some more. But it taps into the same cultural value, that once upon a time, we took care of all of that for ourselves, just like Canada did. Yeah. And this debt beast that we live with um, comes from a globalization push in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So... 50 years later, can we pendulum back to just looking after ourselves? And do you have any thoughts about that, uh, dealing with debt and deficit, or maybe this 20 to 30 year solution of a Bank of New Brunswick working its way incrementally back into our culture? So I think I think the idea is great, the Bank of New Brunswick and one of our uh, members, or maybe it was a writing association, even brought forward that proposal. Um, I, think, I think that the scale at which what needs to be looked at is probably maritime wide and um, there are a number of things like that I think that in terms of uh, thinking regional regionally in terms of greater self-reliance that that makes sense at, a, at that scale um, so a bank you know bank of the maritimes or whatever it would be and uh, that that would be quite exciting to pursue um, and I, I'm quite inspired by the potential for greater meaningful cooperation among the maritime provinces um, by the, the what the Norwegian countries have done over the years so they have a they have interparliamentary cooperation through something called the Nordic Council so there are five countries um, and they have parliamentarians from each of their countries who meet together uh, twice a year once an, an annual thing and then once on a theme based uh, issue um, to tackle issues that uh, are, are best dealt with at a at a Nordic level and um, and then it's sort of passed on to uh, to kind of um, officials at the ministerial and the staff level, and they they kind of have a, a working group under that. So it's pr pretty pretty interesting what they've been able to achieve with that kind of cooperation. So perhaps we should have something like that in the Maritimes. And people talk about in the past, you know, maybe there should be maritime union and. There's, there's all kinds of problems with that, you know. We know Louis Robichaud had a royal commission that looked at it, and uh, and so on. But but uh, the idea of some kind of an interparliamentary interparliamentary cooperation. In the past, we've had had uh, the cabinets meet occasionally, but that's not really it. If we had interparliamentary cooperation, um, that then was able would, would able to be able to handle hand off certain initiatives to uh, kind of a maritime wide uh, officials level then uh, we could do some important things like a maritime bank or like a maritime wide transportation public transportation system uh, to help slay that dragon you know 
It's one thing trying to improve transit center in transit inner cities, but to get a comprehensive system that works in the Maritimes or in, in, in any one of the individual provinces, if we maybe approached it on a regional basis, we might get there. Um, so, and, and the same could be said in a way for tackling the energy transition. Um, and maybe that there's a level of cooperation there that we should be looking at to help make that happen. Uh, but we don't have the institution. Uh, it, one of the things that came out of, of the last big discussion around maritime uh, union, I guess, in the in, that wasn't the last, but the pre, in the 50s, anyways, was was uh, was the um, what's now called the Council of Atlantic Premiers, and uh, it's it's really been hollowed out. Hmm. Um, it doesn't have much of a secretariat anymore. It doesn't have much of a work plan anymore. It just it's just because of the, disinterest on the part of, I guess, the premiers, number of six premiers over time in the last little while, it's kind of, they have their annual meetings and or biannual, whatever they are, and, and not much seems to be going on. So the, 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 um, the, the notions that came out of uh, uh, the 50s originally, this was under Hugh John Fleming, um, pretty interesting recommendations they, they made at the time, uh, did, you know, just haven't haven't really developed into what was envisioned back then in terms of maritime cooperation. Um, so I think I think this Nordic Council concept maybe is a bit of a way to get at it again. It might evolve too, like you talked about local change um, being a place where it starts. Maybe there's something specific, uh, specific area that shows where success can be had if we all cooperated on it. Yeah. Thoughts in that spirit, then. Um, other conversations that have happened around this table have to deal with recycling and the issue of scale and the chance for economic development. Um, would that be a, a maritime one that would get to a certain scale? I'm thinking of um, CEO of Recycle New Brunswick um, when he was here talking about uh, great job opportunity or job creation opportunity outside Sussex or somewhere between in between the three cities and a lot of the material that's um, a value and could be processed, could be done there in a large center, right. could employ two or 300 people. Then you can get to port or you can get um, to rail and ship it. it or, or especially if we looked at it on the scale of the Maritimes, what are the economic opportunities for utilizing waste streams, right? Rather than just collecting them and sending them away somewhere yes. or dumping them in the river. Um, so, so that's one of the things actually the Nordic Council has done quite a lot of work on. And uh, there's no reason we couldn't do that here. And see, with the with the scale, maritime wide scale, then you would be generating volumes um, that uh, you know um, would make the development of those kind of economic opportunities uh, perhaps more viable to uh, to deal with. Because you know you need a certain amount of uh, raw material to to do mm -hmm. manufacturing whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, so there's an interesting possibility and 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 we would have more a greater diversity of waste streams as well across the the entire region than than we do just here so think of uh, even just producing biogas so you know um, if we wanted to see more biogas production from waste streams which is what uh, what which is what uh, uh, the, the forge brothers uh, well father and son are doing um, they're using the waste from food processing and from uh, dairy production mm -hmm. uh, if you look at it across New Brunswick, where you looked at it across the maritime, so okay, what are the sources? And part of their revenue uh, there is not just from the electricity they're selling from the biogas they're producing to like to MB Power, but the revenue they're receiving from McCain's and others who are shipping their what they were having to pay to get rid of to use the feed as feedstock for generating power. So uh, it's scaling scaling that. Um, not up in terms of the magnitude of what they're doing, but but distributing it around uh, the province and the region, taking advantage of the waste streams that are there. We've got seafood, we've got other food processing, we've got uh, wood production waste, uh, wood product production waste, and so on. So all kinds of. But if you you have to look at it in that kind of comprehensive way, which is what the Nordic Council has done, and uh, it's 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 generated a lot of uh, new business activity while uh, capturing. The um, those waste streams and reusing or recycling them, um, and they're very. The Nordic Council is so clear uh, about the agenda, which is to drive the green transition in the Nordic countries, and, that, and this is part of it. So it's it's a, it's a wonderful example. And you've been talking in an indirect way, but it's another cultural perception shift on the narrative on the economy. Now you're talking specifically about a circular economy. 
yeah. which when we talk about it in general terms, people go, what are you talking about? But what you just mapped out the past few moments is an example of how everything's integrated and everything has a value when you shift its perception and it's as actually as a resource. What you consider to waste is a resource for someone else. Right. So it's kind of an ecological approach to use yeah. the kind of buzzword where there's no waste in nature. Yeah. And if we kind of look at, well, can, can we in the economy somehow replicate that uh, so that every every what we see as waste actually we see as raw material for something else yeah. which goes back sort of to the original question when we started the conversation but can we find a way of integrating environment benefit into all the economic discussions that are yeah, well, going to come it, absolutely so yeah. it's, it's uh, that way certainly uh, when we're looking at waste streams and we're looking at mm. at uh, the energy transition away from fossil fuels to renewables and so on uh, when we're looking at shelter and, and, and buildings um, all of those things provide uh, and food uh, uh, and in fact when we look at other reasons we look at forest uh, uh, management wood products um, all kinds of possibilities but you, you need to have that kind of lens um, and it of course does require um, a government that sees it has a role to empower yep. um, as well as protect and uh, and that means maybe more of an activist government in that sense than uh, than uh, governments have seen their role to be for some time. We have about ten minutes left, and I'd like to spend five, if you're willing, um, on a specific issue, which is the development of natural gas issue that will run through 2019, one way or the other. Can you map out your position on what should be done and how it should be done or not done? Well, our our position as Greens is that that uh, the shale gas needs to stay in the ground. That uh, uh, we were opposed to fracking, and we don't believe that we should be increasing the production of fossil fuels, uh, given the climate breakdown we're facing. Um, that we need to be reducing uh, our dependence on fossil fuels, and that means less production, not more; mm. less consumption, not more. Uh, so it's the wrong way. It's a sort of 20th century, um, a 20th century idea that uh, whose time has passed. Uh, so uh, it's no more complicated than that. Uh, in any event, there's nothing that's going to happen very rapidly um, uh, because even if the uh, moratorium is lifted as uh, in the in the Elgin area, Albert County and Sussex area, um, by the provincial government, the new government, then um, the company Corridor Resources is saying, well, you know, uh, we don't have, we haven't got the money to invest in this yet. We've got to find an investor, and there's regulatory issues, and so on and so forth. Gas prices are low, so we're not probably going to actually do anything until 2021 or whatever it is. Okay, so. There's nothing imminent, but but uh, our position is the moratorium should be made permanent. What I was curious to explore is currently uh, in national lens, Alberta is going through a tough time because of fighting for pipelines, and oil is a boom and bust industry, at least as described in the media. We've been talking for about 45 minutes on circular economy, and, and that is definitely not boom and bust. Mm. That is something that's long term and stable, and and within your own means to control your own house or influence your own house. So it's often been a wonder why would a province or some in the province want to hook themselves to an industry that's already proven itself to have huge fluctuations in a 20 or 30 year cycle compared yeah. to all this new technologies opening up a whole other way of doing things. It's just simplistic thinking on the part of politicians on one hand, which is what, what can make a lot of money um, and where else has it happened? Well, uh, look, Alberta, what's happened there? I mean, lots of money. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, and then, you know, the, the lobby lobbyists are at work, of course, too, to serve their self-interest uh, as well. Um, but it's not much more complicated than that. A couple minutes left. How would you like to end off? I mean, the show will last on the Internet for a year or so. <laughs> <laughs> or forever. And, and you'll, look, ah. you'll look younger one day. <laughs> well, thanks, Dennis. I think that would require hair yeah, to make or, that happen. Maybe one day I'll do a collage of when you were first on the show to when you're on the show. <laughs> now, um, but but we all we're all aging the moment we're born. Uh, yeah, I go. Yeah. Yes, I can relate. Um, what's the pleasure of doing the show and the openness of the conversations is stuff will resonate from what you said today. It'll resonate in the summertime. It'll resonate definitely next fall. 
So there's a window here for uh, something that, you know, I think this is going to happen or it would be so nice if this happened. We will work hard to make that happen. You have something to play with in that space that um, and, and gives people confidence because on the outside, on back to the political sphere, the citizens have not seen a four-way conversation before. Yeah, yeah. Media keep wanting to frame it almost back in the old dialogue of us and them. Yeah. Or in power, not in power. And, and it's truly not that way anymore. And I had some fun with some commentaries playing with the, the on the energy or emotional level. The 300,000 people were fed up. Either they voted for change or they didn't vote because they wanted change. Mm-hmm. It, which is a stretch, but on an emotional level, that's kind of where they're at mm-hmm. with politics. And then it happened. Mm-hmm. There's four different colors in that legislature. Right. Now, if we can just integrate First Nations into there a bit more... Um, we're in a really exciting moment in time, but the test is going to come when you start doing the work in the legislature. Yeah, so my my hope absolutely is that that we actually are able to to get to this point where we trust each other enough and find the common ground uh, that where we can collaborate effectively and uh, and address things people are really concerned about. That's people want to see us work together to do that. And we need to find a way to work together to do that, which is why my re- response to the throne speech from uh, Premier Higgs uh, was that based on the success of minority governments in Canadian history, like the famous one of Pearson, uh, the, the secret seemed to be uh, not putting water in your wine and, and making great political compromise, but finding the common ground of, on which you all can stand, work together, and uh, achieve great things. And that's what they did with the other parties in, in Parliament at the time. Brought in Medicare across the country, brought in the Canadian Pension Plan, launched the Royal Commission on uh, the Status of Women, the Royal Commission on Biculturalism, Bilingualism, with, with great impact later, later on. Uh, and that was common ground among the parties, uh, all of those were, and uh, and also nicely reflected the kind of pent up demand or meeting the needs uh, resonating with with Canadians of the day in terms of what needed to be done, and so that all came together quite well. Um, that's where we need to go with this this minority government. Find the common ground, and, and I, it's quite large when the way I outlined it in my speech, um, and concentrate on working on that common ground and and uh, and not. Um, not trying to uh, uh, operate uh, in areas that are not uh, the, the the big diff- the one exception of uh, with the Pearson government years ago federally was the flag, hmm. and he, and it was a huge controversy because uh, that was something they launched that they were committed to. There was no in- you know much interest from others, and uh, and the C- Canadians were kind of really divided on it. Um, I still remember my grandfather was so <laughs> angry uh, about that because, you know, he'd fought in the first war and fought under the Union Jack, and that was good enough for him, and he put it on over the door there in the camp, and that's it. Uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. But that was an example of, you know, where they they said, no, this is what we're going to do, and they, and they did it. But there you go. Great way for us to end. Okay. Thank you. Nice speaking with you. Thank you for watching. As always, be good, have fun, love each other. We're done. Thank you. Yeah. That was great. great.